We all know that Albert Einstein was a genius. But if I asked you what he got his Nobel Prize for Physics for, I think you would probably say the theory of relativity, and you would be wrong. No, it was for the photoelectric effect. Now, what on earth is that? People found that sometimes when you shine light onto a metal, the metal develops a positive charge, from which they deduced that the light was causing electrons to be emitted from the metal. And Einstein suggested an explanation of what was going on there, and that is what I'm going to tell you about today. Einstein suggested that light is made up of particles called photons. Now, these are very strange particles because they don't have any mass. They just consist of little packets of energy. And how much energy is inside the packet depends upon the color of the light, the frequency of the light. Light of low frequency, red light, for example, has very little energy in each of these packets. Whereas light of high frequency, blue light, ultraviolet light, they have a lot of energy in each photon. Now, why is that important? To understand why it's important, we now need to move our story to what's happening in the metal. Now, metals are very, very generous. They're so generous because they only have a few valence electrons. And if they could get rid of those valence electrons, that would reveal the noble gas configuration of their core, which is very stable. Metals react by donating electrons. That works out well when there's a non-metal around to receive it, because non-metals are very greedy. But what about if there are no non-metals around? What about if the only neighbors are other metals, as happens in some metal? Well, then what happens is, all the metals donate those valence electrons to a communal, what we call, sea of delocalized electrons. Now, what's left over when a metal has donated its valence electrons? A positive kernel. It's positive because there are more protons in it than electrons, because the valence electrons have left. So these positive kernels consist of the nucleus, and then the core shells of electrons. Positive and negative attract electrostatically. So these positive kernels attract the sea of delocalized electrons. So although these electrons in the sea are free to move to some extent, they're not completely free to leave the metal. They're held inside the metal by this electrostatic attraction between the positive kernels and them. So now, if these photons of light can give these electrons enough energy, then they could break free from that electrostatic attraction exerted by the positive kernels and be emitted. And that's what happens in the photoelectric effect. So let's take our story to the point where photon meets electron. The photons from the light strike the metal. Now what Einstein proposed is that there's a law about how the transfer of energy from the photons to the electrons can occur. And that is one to one. Each photon has to give all its energy to one electron. No ganging up is allowed. You can't get a number of photons all coming, clubbing together and giving all their energy to one electron. Nor can there be some kind of sharing. You can't get a photon coming along and saying, I'll give you some and I'll give your neighbor some other of the energy. No, all the energy from one photon goes to only one electron. Now, if that amount of energy is sufficient to overcome the attractive force between the electron and these kernels, then 
that electron will be emitted. If the energy the photon comes with is even more than that minimum required, the excess will go off with the electron in the form of kinetic energy. So the more in excess, the more kinetic energy the emitted electrons leave with, and so they move away faster. Now, the story is a little bit more complex than this because the electrons on the surface of the metal are obviously not held as tightly as those that are a bit deeper in, because those that are deeper in are obviously surrounded by these kernels, whereas those on the surface don't have the kernels on one edge, and so there's, there's less attractive force keeping them in. And so, when a photon comes to a surface electron, then it doesn't need to give it that much energy to pull it away in comparison to if rather that photon goes a little deeper and donates its energy to a non-surface, a deeper electron. Then it would take more energy to break its bonds with the metal and then there'd be less left over for kinetic energy. And that's why when you see a simulation of this, you see electrons being shot off at different speeds. And that's because the fastest ones are the surface ones. How do we even know where the photoelectric emission has occurred? Well, what you do is you make the metal to be the electrode within a cathode ray tube. Very simply put, what that means is we have something which has a gap in it, a broken circuit, and that is connected to an external circuit. But the point is that that break in the circuit can only be completed if electrons are emitted from the metal. And when they are, then those electrons then complete the circuit so that we then can detect that by an ammeter or a voltmeter in the circuit. So what we do is we shine light onto that electrode, that metal plate, and we change the properties of that light that we're shining onto it. So we would start off by shining, let's say, red light onto our metal surface. And we would see no current reading, no voltmeter reading. Mm, that means no photoelectric effect occurring. Those photons striking that metal don't have enough energy to overcome the work function of that particular metal. So what do we do? We increase the frequency of the light. Still no readings, mm. still no photoelectric effect. We increase the frequency some more, increase it until the moment that we start to get the photoelectric effect. We start to get a reading in the circuit. Then we pause. In this case, our simulation, if we're really doing it in a laboratory, we stop changing the frequency of our light. And we record the frequency that was at the threshold, at the break between no emission and now from that point onward we get emission. And that is the threshold frequency for that particular metal. We can then convert that because we know the relationship between frequency and energy per photon. So we can then convert that threshold frequency into its equivalent amount of energy, and that is the work function of that particular metal. And before we go, have you already liked? Have you subscribed? Have you left me a comment? And please go and visit my website. You'll find a lot of resources there, and they're categorized in a way that will make it very easy for you to find what you need. Until we meet again, Learn science!